If you can work at Facebook or Google, it's great. If you're at headquarters, it's wonderful. The thing is, headquarters in the big scheme of things is tiny compared to the effect that Google and Facebook and Apple and whoever, Inditex, ABM, if you name it, what these companies have on the economy globally. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. So one of the questions that interests us at Capitalism is, and interests all of us in the world, is why workers' wages haven't increased significantly. Wages have actually stagnated since the 1980s, except at the very top. And the labor share, the part of the national income that's allocated to wages, has significantly declined. And yet, during this period, workers have become much more productive and corporate profits have been soaring. So what's going wrong? Why aren't wages rising. So Jan Eckhout has, economist Jan Eckhout has a new book out in which he called The Profit Paradox, in which he attempts to explore this question and come up with some answers for what it is that's going wrong and what the solutions might be. His main argument is that many of the problems labor are face, is facing is due to the fact that monopoly leads firms to produce less. And they produce less precisely to make more profits, because if they were to increase quantity, prices will decrease and their profits will go down. And so they restrain production in order to keep the prices up. They make a lot of profits, but as a result, they produce less, they employ less, they pay fewer people. So Ian's argument is that because companies have market power, because we have these very market dominant firms, the market power means that they can have high prices. Because of high prices, they produce less goods. Because they can produce less goods, they have less demand for labor. I, I don't know, Luigi, I wasn't quite sure that that tracked for me. I, I get it in a e pure economist point of view. It doesn't seem to me that that's actually what's happening in, in, in the market. For example, would there be more iPhones being produced if Apple were less powerful than it is? Think about Amazon, for instance, which has made its touchstone bringing consumers really, really low prices. Would there be more demand for Amazon services and therefore more jobs for workers if Amazon had even lower prices? So I think he's getting it a really important problem. The diagnosis to me was didn't, didn't always correlate with what I observe in the real world. I will distinguish because I think the Apple case is pretty clear. If Apple phones cost half of what they cost today, many more people will uh, have Apple phones and there will be more demand. Now, you might ask uh, the Apple phone is produced in the United, in, uh, not in the United States, so maybe the, the demand for labor would not be in the United States. But imagine a world in which it is manufactured in the United States. There will be many more people employed in producing Apple phone. And even thinking about uh, Apple produce in China, still, if there were twice as many app Apple phones sold, then you will have many more employed selling apples, or serving Apple in the United States. So I think the demand will definitely be higher for labor. Amazon is an interesting case because the challenge with Amazon is not that they charge non-competitive prices, is that in fact it's quite the opposite, is that they charge prices that are so low that some suppliers cannot survive. And that is in a different way is that maybe the workers of the supply of Amazon get affected as a result of the downward pressure put by Amazon. The simpler way to see his point is to think about the, the case of Apple or, to be fair, think about the case of other companies that have some market power. Think about Coke or Pepsi. If Coke uh, did not have a monopoly on the price of Coke, or on the formula of Coke, there would be more Coke produced. Now, we might discuss whether this would be a good or a bad for the country overall, but certainly it will be more production of coke in the United States and more employment of people producing and distributing coke. So I think in that case, it's, it's definitely the case. And I think that in, in many sectors, we can go to 
sectors where staff is much more important, like dialysis. One of my colleagues uh, has written a very interesting paper about the impact that mergers in the market, uh, in the market for dialysis, the effect that they produce. And it's not only an effect of price, it's an effect of availability. And there are people who die because they can't reach dialysis easily enough because uh, consolidation brought a reduction in the number of points where you can get your dialysis. And prices went up. So the, the big, big uh, part of the agenda is the entire pharmaceutical and healthcare sector where we know the prices are astronomical. And not only are astronomical, they keep going up. I understand your point about Apple. If prices were lower, there would be more demand. There would be more need for workers. But why would that necessarily translate into higher wages for, for, for workers? And I know, I know, supply and demand. But it just seems to me that in a world awash with labor, that it might translate into more jobs for people, but wouldn't necessarily address the wage issue. Let me try to explain with actually some work that a former student of mine, Sim, Simka Barkai, did you have probably heard repeated all the time that the share that labor is taking of national income has gone down. Everybody is saying, oh, if the share of labor has gone down, must be that the share of capital has gone up. Now, this is true only in a competitive world, because in a competitive world, you remunerate two factors, labor and capital, and profit are zero. And so that's the end of the story. In a non-competitive world, you need to fi figure out that there is a share of capital, there is a share of labor, and then the leftover is the share of profits. What Simca does is that he shows that not only the share of labor has gone down, also the share of return to capital has gone down, and the leftover, the share of profits, has gone up. Now, these profits are most of the time appropriated by the owner of capital, so from a practical point of view, you don't see much of a difference between the two interpretations. But from a substantive point of view, is an enormous difference. Why? Because in a world in which the return to capital has gone up, you will see people investing like crazy. If I know that I can get twice the money I invest, I will invest like crazy. In a world in which the share of profits has gone up, you know that by putting more capital, not only you don't necessarily get more profit, you might actually get less profits because you are increasing quantity and that leads to a decrease in prices. Okay? And so what he documents is over the years, over the last 20 years, the share of profits has gone up and at the expense of the share of uh, labor. So think of the world in which you remunerate capital based on the risk of a project, and then the rest is either labor share or profit shares. If profits get more, labor get less, and vice versa. And that's the world we live in. So we wanted to bring Ian in to talk to him about this relationship between market power, an observed phenomenon that, that we all see, and the supposed free market capitalism that exists in the United States. It's a bit ironic. The United States is supposed to have the freest markets in all the world, and yet this problem of market power appears to be most concentrated in the United States. Is there, in this new world we're in, is there some kind of actual contradiction between free markets and, and market power? Are they, are they, does the embrace of one inherently lead to the rise of the second? You know, there, there is a close link between, I would say, capitalism and market power in the following sense. But before I say this, I don't think it's just a United States versus Europe issue because it's as much here in Europe. I mean, I'm holding a cell phone that's it's an iPhone, so it's, it's full of market power. Everything we do is overpriced that we use is overpriced products. So, so it's not just the United States versus the rest of the world thing. It's a global phenomenon. Now, when you say, is that a problem with capitalism? I think capitalism, you know, works very well when, well, we know when the conditions for malfunctioning markets uh, are holding. Now, fast technological change is basically a situation in which these conditions typically do not hold. Or technologies with network effects, with high fixed uh, cost upfront investments, with high R&D uh, cost upfront, these are not kind of the standard typical sectors situations that are going to give you competitive outcomes. And so capitalism is wonderful 
as long as well we ensure that the conditions for competitive pricing are met and when they're not well i think we only have one option we have the option of regulating that and that's why we have had antitrust by the way this is not a new thing i mean the investment in railways oil phone and telegraph all these new technologies generated the same type of economies of scale that allowed some firms to dominate their markets and it gave rise as a reaction a political reaction to quite a bit of the antitrust legislation that we know now i mean the sherman act is from that period most of the antitrust regulation is from that period what i believe is the case is that politically there is a tendency to equate pro market with pro business and i think there's a huge difference i mean you guys are called like that but being pro business means let's allow these firms to build nice moats around their castles as uh, warren buffett would say allow them to 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 build such market power because guess what i mean it generates high profit so basically business is doing well so the economy is doing well and that's what i think is precisely the, the the paradox that if the economy is doing well measured by the stock market we have to be a little bit careful because the stock market is a measure of profitability of firms and if this is all driven by innovation and new technologies and competitive markets then this is great but if instead we see that the stock market is booming because you know there's a few firms who dominate who are extracting rents from customers because they have market power then this is really a bad sign for the economy another uh, connection you draw, which is that this hasn't been good for workers. And that's not something that's obvious to me. Why Why is that? You would think, okay, I'm going to be a naive idealist here. You'd think a big company earns lots of money. It has tons of profits. Its profits are protected. It can do really good things for its workers. Why doesn't it work that way? It works in part like that, because if you can work at Facebook or Google, it's great. If you're at headquarters, it's wonderful. The thing is, headquarters in the big scheme of things is tiny compared to the effect that Google and Facebook and Apple and whoever, Inditex, ABM, if you name it, what these companies have on the economy globally. Basically, it's an effect that says, you know, you have enough firms that have dominance that have through their pricing of their output goods affect what happens to the demand for labor and that lowers the wages. What happens if you sell an iPhone for $1,200 and the cost is $350? Well, you know, if they had sold it for $400, okay, in a competitive market, they would have produced maybe two times, three times as many, okay, instead of what is the number, two billion iPhones, we would have four or six billion iPhones. What that means is that you're going to basically have to produce more. If you have to produce more, that means that, you know, somehow you need more labor. I know that these devices are now produced in factories with robots, but we have a lot of services attached to this. What it means is that we have basically a lot less demand for labor because there's just fewer units sold at these higher prices. If the demand for labor goes down, prices, i.e. wages, go down. And so that is the connection that we find. The wage stagnation that we've seen since the 1980s is, can be linked to the rise in this market power and it goes hand in hand. And so this is not coming because just Facebook is exerting market power. It's coming because Facebook, AB InBev, Google, Inditex, whatever set of companies that are at the top of the food chain in terms of, of dominance, what they're doing jointly has an equilibrium effect on wages. This is now something that I think legally, basically saying that there's nothing really that you can do immediately because it, it, it's like uh, dealing with pollution. You know, I cannot stop someone who drives a car and say, I get asthma. It's not because of your car I get asthma. I get asthma because there's thousands of cars in my neighborhood. And that's what's causing it. And we cannot identify the kind of individual cause perpetrator of my asthma. And it's the same thing the worker cannot say, you know, I get a low wage because that firm charges too high a price for the product it sells. And this is, I think, the, the big problem that we have to, first of all, start to think about. Okay, we have to start to think about how to incorporate it. I don't think the solution is to have, you know, workers sitting on boards. If it helps to somehow have a kind of more peaceful way of doing business, all, by all means. But this is not going to solve the problem. Because once these workers are on the boards, they still have the objective for the firm to do well. And, you know, if I'm on the board of Facebook as a worker, what I want is, you know, to do well for all my workers within Facebook. And they're, they're just going to maximize the joint 
surplus and it's again maximizing profits. So basically the workers on that board are not going to you know, worry about what happens to workers who basically suffer from this economy-wide effect on, uh, on wages. I was also thinking as, as, as you were talking, and tell me if you agree with this, that some of the challenge in this is that there really is no one-size-fits-all solution the way there might have been in a simpler economy. I was thinking about this relative to Amazon. Brad Stone in his new book was making the argument that by traditional antitrust metrics, Amazon will never be prosecuted for antitrust because it has such a small share of the overall retail market. And yet, if you talk to a seller whose entire business is dependent on Amazon and can be shut down in a day by a change in Amazon policy, they would argue a very different picture. It's just everything is in how you look at something. I've been thinking a lot about the healthcare system, for example, where you may look on a nationwide basis in the United States and say it's fragmented, but a hospital chain that has an, a large presence locally can still affect the rates that insurers pay. There's no one way to look at, at any industry, and that makes the job far more complicated of determining what actually is too much power and how it's happening because it is so radically different. I mean, I cannot agree more. We have to really have tailor-made uh, regulation. I mean, every single sector, every single firm nearly of these dominant firms is different. I'm arguing for more resources and smarter brains to look at it. And, and, and I think, again, as you uh, uh, just mentioned, you know, very tailor-made solutions for every case. Can I follow up? But uh on the wages, I, I agree with you. But what about on the suppliers, like the supplier that Bethany was talking about? The way antitrust is interpreted today is ignoring completely that effect. Should it consider it or not in your view? The question is, how can you do it? Because again, a supplier is just another input in production as labor is an input in production. And if prices of inputs change because upstream, there's a large number of firms that have uh, dominant positions. Again, we cannot attribute the effect on a given supplier's profitability or prices directly. It's coming through an equilibrium effect. And that's basically, I think, the big challenge. No, I understand the general equilibrium, but I think, and Bethany, feel free to intervene here because I'm interpreting your words, but I think that Bethany was talking about a partial equilibrium effect, it's simply the fact that today, if I'm a supplier of Amazon, I end up having Amazon controlling my life, what I sell, when I sell, at what price, and whether I'm in business tomorrow. Some people are concerned that that's too much power in, in one individual, and they think that antitrust could help reduce that concentration of power. Yes, I agree that, that antitrust has a role to intervene. I mean, think about a network, kind of a network uh, platform. We know that the network generates, basically, first of all, needs size, so it has to be large. It generates benefits that are not competitive in a sense. They can't be competed away. And those benefits might be generated through information. They might be generated through certain actions, even though in a pure property rights sense, Apple's doesn't allow app uh, users you know, to be on it unless they pay 30% as a, as a fee. I think there's a role for a regulator. There's a role for a regulator to say, well, Apple, you're lucky that you have that huge platform, that huge size of a market. We don't want too many of those because we want to exploit the efficiency gains. But we also realize that given that you have that platform, you don't face any competition on that platform. Okay? And so whatever the regulator would do, in the case of Bethany's uh, Amazon example, would be you know, taking into account all these kind of side effects, if you want, that are not directly affecting the customer, but they're affecting all the kind of players that are directly involved. The way I try to think about it is that it, it may be arguably, in fact, even good for the customer if Amazon is selling somebody's product and Amazon, you know, snoops on all the data and says, what do customers like most about this and comes in and undercuts that that business and puts them out of business by making their own cheaper model. You might say all's, all's fair and love and war and e-commerce. But yet, on the other hand, these questions to me go to the heart of our society and the kind of society that we're shaping and how we want to live and whether our society is stable. So I think they are really big fundamental questions, not just that are broader than the economy, because they go to the heart of this notion of fairness. And the more you have people feel like they're living in a world that isn't fair, where their business can just be cut out from under them and there's nothing there to stop that, that from happening, the less stable a society you have, right? And that's, I think, dangerous for everybody over the long term, maybe even over the short term. 
you know, we don't need small businesses that are inefficient. Okay, we don't have to keep small businesses alive just because they're small and we want to kind of do some good for these businesses. But we need at least some businesses that impose kind of a fringe competition to these larger ones. You don't need to be a big player to just plug into the AT&T network and offer service. You don't need to be the size of AT&T, but by being small and easily uh, 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 kind of having access to that market, you do have an effect on the price that AT&T can charge. Because if you as a small player start to lower your prices, you start maybe with, you know, a particular community that you'd want to target, this is going to have an effect. They're going to lose customers. And in that sense, you know, we need those small players, but I don't think we have to subsidize these inefficient small players. We have to set the stage, you know, to move the goalpost of the competitive environment in such a way that there is real competition. I think, and this is now way beyond economics, this is something that we is both politically and socially potentially very harmful, okay? Because the, the type of polarization that we see in economic terms translates in political polarization and translates in social polarization. It looks like being very negative and very pessimistic, but the way this type of uh, market power that generated inequality ended in the second industrial revolution in 2014, uh, 1914 was with war. So we had one war, one great depression and another war. I don't think it will be easy to uh, for many people and then we all own stocks some way or another to say, hold on, 34,000, the Dow Jones? Well, if you had competition, it's going to be 10,000. Are we going to lose that much money, all of us? I mean, these are the type of questions we have to think about in what the consequences are going to be if you really want to be serious about this. And, and the social issues related to that, to that tension that are, in my view, directly derived from the economic issues, okay, we have to, we're going to have to be facing very soon because, you know, this, this, is, this keeps going. I mean, I don't think the Dow Jones, even if we have a recession because people think there's going to be inflation, you know, the Dow Jones is not going to stop. Uh, uh, rising in the long run, uh, unless we do something about the market power. I could not agree more, but as economists, maybe we bear a bit of responsibility here because generally there are two types of economists. There are the economists a la Mariana Mazzucato, they want the government to do everything, to innovate, to spend a lot, etc. And then there are the minimalist economists who wants the government completely out of the economy including direct regulation. So I always uh, cite this example. Early on in the social media, there was a company called Power Ventures. And this company was basically disintermediating Facebook, was connecting a consumer with multiple social media at the same time, allowing what we call in jargon multi-homing, that for normal human being means being in multiple platforms at the same time. And that really takes away a lot of the power of Facebook. Now, Facebook saw immediately the, the threat and sued the hell out of Power Ventures and was able to establish something that, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems to me crazy, which is that if I give to Bethany, log in to my Facebook account, uh, log in and password, and she comes in with my permission, she commits a federal crime, which is hacking. Okay? So this, this is an example of how the power of the lawyers, the lobbying, etc., are so important to create, to shape the technology in a more monopolistic direction. I am of the view that technology is not just a manna that falls from the heaven, but is something that can be shaped. And we need a government that is not directing where to go, because I don't think that it's capable of doing it, but it should be directing the traffic so that the market remains competitive. Don't you think that we have been missing as economists in doing that? I completely agree. I, I cannot agree more. I mean, I think talking now about the solutions, in my view, I mean, we have to agree how costly it is to have this, this market power. I think it's costly, you know, you can, you can measure it different ways, but I think there's different uh, pieces of research that measure it high. We measure it as 9% of GDP per year, so that, that's high. Compared, by the way, to say the cost of inflation, which is less than 1%. I think that the first thing we have to do as economists is advocate for a much stronger kind of knowledge base in order to do something about it. 
to deal with the one percent or half percent of cost of inflation, we've set up an independent central bank. And I think from an academic point of view, it's the biggest success that economists have had in terms of influencing policy because it's controlled inflation. It's done at a very uh, professional academic way. It's done, you know, with a lot of people. I mean, the, the, the Federal Reserve System has about 30,000 people. Okay. Now look at what we do with antitrust. We have around 3,000 people working between the FTC, between the, the uh, Department of Justice. I mean, that's about one tenth. Now, if we want to use that one tenth of the force the, the, of people I, I kind of behind that to solve a problem that is 10 times larger in terms of the cost of GDP, it seems to me that this is just completely disproportional. And I think one of the things that we should do is that every market is different, you know, and so we should look much more specialized. We should deal with patents in a different way. A patent for a vaccine is very different from, from a patent for, uh, say, you know, software at the moment. The legal status of this is identical. And so I think there's a lot more that we can do, much more knowledge based, much more, if you want, technological, much more scientific okay, to address this issue. And this brings me back to the independent uh, Federal Reserve. We need to make this independent of the political system. And if we can make such an kind of an authority independent of the political system, I think half the battle is won. Uh, Ian, you consider yourself an industrial organization economist, right? Actually, I, if, 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 if I, I, I don't like labels too much, but if you push me on a label, I would say I'm, I'm kind of a macro labor economist. I see. That, that makes it even more interesting because what I notice is that all the industrial organization economists I know in the United States, so maybe all is too extreme, but the way, way majority of them don't seem to be too worried about the stuff that you are describing. The only one who are worried tend to be Europeans or known industrial organization economists. And so your opinion, do you think that this correlation is invented? If it's not invented, is there a potential reason or uh, wh why do you think that's the case? First of all, I, I, I agree with you that a lot of people in the IEO com community do not see it as a problem, but I, I also think that there's more than just a few people and not just a few Europeans who are kind of, you know, marginal uh, uh, or fringe in, in the profession. I think there's more people who have, have a concern. Okay, I, I think that, the, the, I mean, I won't name names because I don't want to put people in, on, on the spot that they, they'll do it themselves, but there's there's people in, I think, the, you know, at the top of the pyramid, if you want, in the, in, in the, in the elite universities who, um, who, who believe the same thing. Now, I think the best thing for us as academic economists is that there's an open debate. And the most productive way of having progress, making progress, is to have difference of opinion. I mean, if we all were to agree, I don't see that we would actually find or get to the minute details of what exactly is going on. Because if someone wants to prove wrong what someone else says, then we really going to get at it. And I think that's happening. And if it turns out that, you know, what I and co-authors find is proven wrong, I mean, I think this is part of the discovery process. We don't have to, you know, claim something to be the truth before we've established it. And if it's wrong, it's great. We've learned something. At the moment, my reading of the facts is that, that there is an issue. People have different opinions for different reasons. It may be because they study different markets. There's different measurement issues. There's different issues about how you really can come to the conclusion. You know, one thing is to say broadly there is market power. The other thing to say is that, you know, how do you quantitatively establish this? But I, I would suggest let's, let's have as many kind of points of view on the same problem. And as I said, in terms of the solution with my independent federal uh, competition authority, let's have more people, smart people look at it. And, and again, we can, we can have a different solution for, you know, the problem between or with Facebook, uh, um, Instagram and WhatsApp than we have for ABM. We can have very different solutions. And if smart people look at it, you know, we do market design as economists to auction off bandwidth for our uh, uh, mobile communication. I think we can do a lot of stuff in terms of market design to improve how eBay works, you know eBay has a dominant position. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that we can do. And, and we have, you know, smart people who are willing to do it. 
Ian, you touch a sensitive topic because as you know, or you might know, we have a, po a previous podcast about marketing design of the spectrum. And now this was not designed maybe optimal from a public finance point of view because of the interests of some players. So I think there's a very tricky issue here, which is the one I, you, you, you very brilliantly try to avoid, but I want to bring you back because I think it's important. So we, I agree that if the best minds are independently trying to work to, to, to find the truth, they will figure it out. And I think that's what academic research is about. However, my impression is sometimes finding one truth is more rewarding than finding another truth. And then the system doesn't work uh, uh, very well. So uh, to what extent this is true in, in I.O., in the economic profession at large? I mean, look, there is a revolving door. So you, you're pressing me. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. There's a re revolving door. One of the things I have argued before is that let's cut the link. Let's start with cutting the link between politics and the policy. Okay. We've done it successfully for controlling inflation with a, a wonderful success story for academic economists that we have an, an independent central bank that is successful in setting inflation. It doesn't work in Argentina. It doesn't work in many other countries. It didn't work in the United States in the 70s either, but now it works. Okay? For now. now <laughs> for, for now. Now, we, 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 that's, that's a fair point. Now, uh, by the way, one of these things in terms of policies, we also have to be able to adjust as times change. I mean, things change, so we have to be able to adjust our policies as, as things evolve. So, so that's the first step. One of the reasons I believe that, you know, you have a revolving door, maybe with people having opinions that are, you know, they're also there's also a principal agent problem between the academic economist who, who works, say, for a company and who has who is, is voicing opinions. Well, again, you know, Let's have someone design those. Now you would say, who's going to kind of design the designer, right? Because we, we, we can go further and further and always there's going to be an agency problem. But let's start by cutting the link between politics and policy. Okay. I'm not arguing that we have to have, you know, technocrats deciding everything. There's political oversight for sure, as there is with the, the, the independent central bank. But I think if, if we start to make steps where we think about the optimal design rather than assume it, I mean, you know, this interoperability is very easy to implement in the United States telecom market. It doesn't take, you know, really, really, really very smart people. It takes just a little bit of common sense. You look around, you say, let's see the other countries, what they do. That's, by the way, how it worked with the independent central banks, too. You know, I believe it was uh, New Zealand that did it first. People start to see the results and it was easily adopted. We knew from the theory how to do it. You know, Lucas has, had told us in the 70s, but it took until the 80s, 90s before it was actually implemented. And I think that's, that's feasible, that's doable. The revolving door is going to be slowed down, it's going to be a li little bit more friction and a bit more kind of, you know, squeaking once this political connection is, is broken. And I think that's going to be the first step. Now, of course, you have to ask the people who benefit from it to break the connection, and that's the hard part. Yes. And you have to ask somebody to pay for it who isn't going to benefit benefit from it, which is another hard part. Perfect. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Do you agree with his argument? Do you think that this that market power is primarily the reason why we haven't seen the share of natural, na national income that's allocated to wages, why we haven't seen that grow, go, going up? I think it's a combination of three factors. Now, decomposing them is a bit difficult, but one factor is certainly what he says, that is the, the market power on the product market side. There is also another aspect that he, uh, Ian talks about in his book that is uh, monopsony or oligopsony. This is uh, really a technical term, but it, when you have uh, monopsony, when you have only one buyer, oligopsony is when you have a uh, fewer buyer. And in many labor markets, you have a limited number of employers. And actually, of all people, Adam Smith said first is when you have few employers, they often uh, end up meeting even for reason of enjoyment, he says, and uh, they conspire to keep the price of labor low. So, And even if they don't conspire directly, I think that the risk that they internalize the potential effect of raising wages is uh, pretty strong. So if I am a small uh, firm and I desperately need a worker, I'm going to 
raise the price. I don't care about the effect that this has on everybody else. If I am a large employer in a deserted area, I think twice before I hire another worker at a higher price because that will impact all my cost of labor. And that's a situation in which you have some monopsony power and that will keep wages low and less, less competition for wages. Then there is the fact of certainly outsourcing has reduced some of the demand for labor here. So the fact that it's much easier to move capital around and move uh, labor around. And so if you pu and, uh, produce a lot abroad, you decrease the demand for labor locally. And the last point that uh, is often uh, forgotten, but I think is important, is there are a lot of uh, friction designed to make more difficult to raise wages. So for example, a third of new employment as some form of non-compete agreement. This non-compete agreement not only makes it more difficult for you to get a raise, but also for the other people next to you to get a raise. Because most of the time, the reason why I get a, a raise is because one of my colleagues got an offer at another big university, and then the dean realizes that if they want to keep not only that colleague, but all the other ones, they raise somewhat the wage to everybody. Now, if that colleague has a non-compete agreement that he cannot go and work for any other university, he does not get the offer, but he's not getting the offer also means that everybody else does not get a raise. I think that that externality is underappreciated because traditionally non-compete agreements were reserved for top employees and stuff like that. But today, sometimes even if you go to work at McDonald's, you have a non-compete agreement. And to be fair, and I want our listeners to know uh, this because it's important. If you live in the free republic of California, non-compete agreements are not enforceable. So they are written. Your employers might ask you to sign it. Sign it freely because they are not enforceable because of the decision of the Supreme Court of California. But in other states, they are. And in fact, some states have made them more enforceable in recent years. The ability to, to put in place a non-compete is an expression of market power, and doing so increases your, mar your market power. So a virtuous circle for the exerciser of, of market power and a vicious circle for those who are being exercised. I was also thinking, as I was thinking about our guest's book, that, that it does come back to this issue of antitrust laws being, in some ways it's relevant to this issue of antitrust laws being organized around what's good for consumers, and that one of the complicating things in this conversation is that some of this, well, uh, arguably, arguably some technological progress has been really, really good for customers, but yet customers are the same as workers in an economy, right? And so even if it's good for customers in some ways, even if you can argue customers are, are benefiting, the customers are the workers. And I think we tend too often to think of things in artificial buckets. There's the customer and there's the worker, when in reality, they're actually the same person, right? Yes, but to defend a bit the, the so-called uh, uh, consumer welfare approach, there is a logic to it and is, is the following. What we are concerned is that we adjudicate antitrust decision on the base of a fight between different producers in which we protect one pr producer at the expense of another one. And that becomes a very difficult political decision and, and a decision that is not very suitable to a, a judge. Uh, you might want to have some industrial policy, but you don't want to delegate industrial policy to a judge. Uh, and so I think that uh, uh, the consumer welfare was a clever way to reduce the discretionality of the decision and, and so make it more viable for judges to implement. What should have been done is uh, some other decision or some other intervention that complement this decision. I, now we are putting too much in the basket of if we fix antitrust, we fix everything. I think that what we need to be careful is we need uh, some regulation that promotes competition, uh, as was done in the past. Uh, interoperability among phones was crucial to the success of the cell phone industry. We don't even bother about that uh, or think that this is uh, invasive regulation. Is what we call pro-competitive regulation. And uh, the same is true for the availability of voice over the internet or the portability of the cell phone number or even the sharing of some of the infrastructure. All this regulation that exists in the traditional industry of telecommunication 
is not there in the new industries. And the new industries are disproportionately favor one side at the expense of everybody else, concentrating not only economic power, but also political power. So I think that that's what we need to be very careful about. Have you ever wondered what goes on inside a black hole? Or why time only moves in one direction? Or what is really so weird about quantum mechanics? Well, then you should listen to Why This Universe. On this podcast, you'll hear about the strangest and most interesting ideas in physics, broken down by physicists Dan Hooper and Shalma Wegsman. If you want to learn about our universe, from the quantum to the cosmic, you won't want to miss Why This Universe, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. So, Bethany, what do you think about Ian's idea of a central bank-like antitrust? I, I worried about that idea a little bit because I think per some of the other episodes we've done, he's highlighting the independence of the central bank and of this as a viable approach for the future without... And it's a central bank of old. It's Paul Volcker's central bank without without taking into account that every institution can become politicized. And our central bank now, I think, is not the pure repository of of profound decisions that it might once have been. I think it's it's become politicized as well. And I think in anything to deal with a bigger swath of the economy, it's not that money isn't a swath of the economy, it's, it's, it is the economy, but it's the bedrock. And if you're thinking about a central bank to regulate business, keep, how do you, how, it, it sounds theoretically good, but how do you possibly keep that free of political and corrupting influences? It, 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 it felt like an academic solution to me, a beautifully elegant academic solution, but one that would be problematic in the real world. Yeah, I think you use uh, academic like I use journalistic, uh, and it's not a term of endearment. <laughs> but, but I agree with you on this because uh, I actually am more populistic in this view, and I signed with, I think it was William Bla- Buck- Buckley Jr. that said, I prefer to be governed by people randomly chosen from the phone book, when the phone book is still existed, rather than that this, the Harvard uh, Senate. I am uh, with you. I think that certainly having expert advice is very valuable, but it's very dangerous to substitute expert for political decision because experts have politics too and very often is hidden. Certain decisions are political decisions and should be taken with some democratic process, doing in a closed room. Now, they're not a smoke-filled room anymore because people know better than smoking, but they still have the same stale air and you don't bring enough alternative uh, views to the table. I'm not that enamored of what central banks have done recently, and I would not use them as a benchmark uh, uh, to export uh, in other places. Right. What do you think about the argument that Ian makes that uh, many of the people who advocate for antitrust enforcement also own quite a bit of stock in those very companies and might be negatively affected by it? I would argue, I'll, I'll try some sort of answer. I would argue that we conflate things we shouldn't conflate, like being pro-market and being pro-business. And we tend to disaggregate things that we actually should conflate. So we think of things from the perspective of the consumer or the investor and the worker, instead of accepting and recognizing that we are all, all three. We are all consumers. We are all workers. We are all investors. And so stock prices in your portfolio are going up dramatically, but you're being laid off off by the firm that employs you, well, then there's a canceling out effect, right? And so this this disaggregation in this context, I think, is singularly unhelpful. Yeah, but uh, to be fair, even if we are all the three things, some people have a lot of stock and they don't work much, and some people have no stock and they work a lot. So the distributional effect is, are pretty large. And, and I think that Ian is right that if you were to enforce antitrust uh, effectively, you will have an impact on the stock market overall, more, I think, on particular companies than on the market overall, because uh, they will be creating different opportunity. But especially if you're not well diversified, if you own a lot of Amazon stock or Facebook stock, I think that that will impact you. And I saw it firsthand at the meeting of the Chicago Council, and uh, there was a person in the audience that raised his hands and they said, uh, oh, but why do you want to enforce antitrust? I own uh, some uh, some stock and I don't want the stock to go down. So we'll have an impact. And that's the reason why 
going back, it, it's it's a political decision because it has to do with redistribution and could not, uh, cannot be simply delegated to experts because experts might have a particular view, viewpoint on this. It's interesting in a way, isn't it, in that China is almost running the experiment for the U.S., and I'm gro generalizing grossly, I realize, but when you have China cracking down on Ant Financial and on its powerful corporate sector and saying, no, we're not going to allow this kind of power, even though this would be better for for these companies' stock price capitalizations and for the amount of money they were they're, they're able to make, it's 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 almost an experiment of sorts, which will be interesting to observe, right, as we go forward in our own experiment. Yeah, it's an irony that uh, a communist country uh, value antitrust more than a free market country. <laughs> yeah, that I would say is a great irony. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.